Hey, in this episode, I have my friends, Jill and Bennett with Dirty Dough Cookies on, and I'm an advisor to that company. So everything, everything that you hear, I just know that I'm an advisor to that company. But we talk about their relationship as Bennett being that founder, that visionary, and and Jill being a founder of a brand herself, but really uh, uh, great on the operations side of things. And then we get into a second discussion around generating revenue outside of the four walls. I think more franchisors should be thinking about how they can help their franchisees generating revenue outside of the four walls. And then we hit the question where uh, I asked them, are cookies a fad? So I hope you enjoy this episode with uh, Bennett and Jill with Dirty Dough. Representing Franchise Secrets, Eric Von Horn. Welcome to the show, you two. Thank you. I said, um, I said, Jill, be nice to you here. I won't be so nice to to Bennett, but let's let's beat you up a little bit right away, Jill. Uh, you are the brains behind uh, Dirty Dough, but you are also telling me how you were you were a podcaster before podcasting was popular, and you said, "Hey, this podcasting thing will never work." What was that all about? Well, don't, I'm not a fortune teller. Let me just put it that way. So it, it was 20 years ago. Ask me what I had for breakfast today, Eric. No, I ask. I ask the tough questions. These are the tough questions. You were you did radio, right? Yeah, it was radio. Like, what did you talk about? Uh, it was just sort of a mishmash. It wasn't anything interesting. Like, like Dear Abby was it Dear Abby? No, I didn't do personal problems. I did, um, you know, little little bits of inspiration. I had background music. It was kind of a zen thing. Ooh, I like it. We're going to have to dig up the archives, Bennett, and find this stuff out. <laughs> That's why I'm not going to tell you the name. But I had a little bit of a following, you know. So how did you get how did you get from being having the little radio following to being a uh, into franchising and doing all the cool stuff they've done in franchising. Oh, well, that little radio following was a, a side gig. I've been in franchising for, I was running the numbers today over 40 years. Oh my gosh. So, uh, but I want to tell you what I had for breakfast. Hey, um, Jill, um, would you let us know what you had for breakfast today? Thank you for asking, Eric. I had the sweet potato dirty dough cookie. Oh my gosh, Ben, have you had it? I have. My friend said that, that was her best, her favorite cookie, and she hasn't seen it for a year. So I think it was Sunday morning. Somebody knocked on my door. My kids answered it, and it was a box of dirty stuff. She she had door dashed it to me. So, yes. Well, it's revamped from last year, and it is like having grandma's sweet potato casserole with a little bit more sweetness in it. Oh, it was great. So I figured. I had a little vegetable, healthy breakfast. Man, I'm. I wonder if uh, if I could get one of those out here in Spearfish, South Dakota. Don't you know? We better act fast because it's going better on. Hurry up! Better hurry up! Out of. Okay, so I want to talk to. We got some cool stuff that we want to talk about in regards to like mobile units. You're doing some cool stuff over there at Dirty Dough with mobile units. One of our brands at Front Street. We do some cool stuff with it with getting them into salon suites before they open up their retail. So I think there's something to be said for making some, some having some, some uh, entries for franchisees to get in before or while they are also in a retail center. So we definitely wanna talk about that. But Jill, I've been impressed with you and your background from day one, from the, the first time that we spoke uh, a number of years ago. Um, I'd love the audience to know a bit about who you are, your background, because Bennett, as the founder, brought in somebody that had the skill set and the experience and expertise that he didn't have. And that's one of the reasons I respect Bennett so much. So um, give us a little bit of your background. Yeah, in 1983, I, I, I was a skier. I skied a lot. I wanted to start a business where 
I could just work in the summer and I have all winter to ski. So I started at a company called Maui Waui. Um, it's smoothies and coffees. It was in 83. Nobody knew what smoothies were. Um, and started doing that at, at events. So it was a mobile business right out of the gate. Um, and I quickly realized this is not a just a seasonal business. It became year round. And then I thought, man, I need to franchise this. Went to a franchise attorney in 83 or 84 and said, can you do this? He said, no, we can't franchise. If you don't have territories, we can't franchise. So I finally, I looked around, finally found somebody that would actually do it. So, and he'd never done it before. It was from that information. I think that Maui Waui was the first mobile franchise in the country, at least. Nobody has corrected me, so I'm going to go with that. It's a fact. But, it's a uh, fact right now. It's a fact now. Yeah, because I've said it on on your podcast. On radio shows and podcasts. <laughs> So anyway, you know, we started selling franchises pretty quickly out of the gate. Um, and I uh, I thought they're not going to do as well as we have. We've, we've worked, you know, this is our baby. We've invested so much time build, building a following. Our first franchisee whipped us. They did more in, I think it was Seattle area than we did after having operated for a long time. So I realized we were on to something. Anyway, Maui Wow, it grew to, in its heyday, close to 700 franchisees. We still have, uh, you know, we're still running. And so this is about 35-year franchise, 40-year um, company. And um, it's worked really, really well. But through this long span of time, I, I was able to tweak things and kind of eliminate things that didn't work and... Um, really figure out how to maximize, you know, you're at an event for a very short period of time. You've got this captive audience. How are you going to capture it? How are you going to um, get the product out really, really fast? So, you know, streamlining the little tricks and things, it's evolved into a pretty solid, um, well, obviously long-term business. Um, after that, so the company sold to Cajal Brands um, maybe six years ago, seven years ago. I started having people ask me, how can I, can you do this with my business? And I was just giving out lots of free advice. And then I thought, man, I need to just charge for it. So I, I set up a, a business helping already successful businesses franchise. And, um, you know, turnkey, you've got depending on what the brand is, six to 12 months, and I'm handing you a, you know, complete franchise ready um, package. I, I only wanted to do a few customers. I had two clients right out of the gate. Both of them asked me to run their company because typically um, founders are not interested in the day-to-day -day operations, don't like it, and aren't good at it. No offense, Bennett. And um, so I chose one of them and was CEO of, of that particular one only because of the proximity and it it excited me a little bit more. And happy running that company, grew that to about 90 franchisees, 80, 88, 90 franchisees. And then um, Bennett reached out to me. So that's the full evolution. And basically, you know, mobile has been my life. Mobile's not for everybody. Um, but I know that done right, mobile can be a cash cow. Attention, franchisors and franchisees. There are two really important resources that I want to share with you that will help you avoid costly mistakes and increase your enterprise value. The first is our free Facebook group. It's a community that has over 4,000 franchisees and franchisors in it. When somebody asks a question, they get honest and authentic answers from multiple perspectives. You can join the group for free over at FranchiseSecrets.com forward slash Facebook. The second resource I want to share with you is if you're a franchisor and you're frustrated that you're not awarding as many franchises as you thought you would, this is the reason I created the Franchisor Mastermind. If you want access to the information, the techniques that the best franchise sales organizations are using to award franchises, and you want what mature brands have, with their playbook of having happy, successful franchisees that grow the right way, then you might want to check out the Franchisor Mastermind. 
The reason why people join is they want access to my Rolodex, my connections. They want the playbook to achieve both short-term and long-term success. They want to increase enterprise value in their brand. Links will be in the show notes or at scalablefranchise.com. I like it. All right. I'm going to switch to Bennett to hear a little bit of his version of the story. That same story, but I want to hear his version of it. But Bennett, like, first of all, what's going on here? Like I was looking at your beard. It's looking good. Um, but there's, you're missing some spots. What, what do you, what's the, is that on purpose? Do you have like, that is distinct mustache or is that you just missing a little bit of hair? It, uh, yeah. It just, it won't grow. This is literally gross. You should do some type of like replacement. So it just, just grows. I like it. <laughs> do you have a Harley yet, Bennett? Looks like you're headed to a Harley. <laughs> I'll look into it. So what's your version of, of that same story? Because you've got the franchise expert, been there, done that with her own brand, helped another one do it successfully to just about a hundred locations. And then you as the founder, realizing that you're probably the visionary, if you're looking at the, the rocket fuel or traction or EOS thing, you got integrators and visionaries realizing that you're probably a true visionary, which it takes a a while for founders to realize that, but I think you realize that and you needed that, that second in command or your equal on the operational piece of things. So help, um, help other founders, um, as you kind of tell your version of the story. So Jim was the first one to do mobile, not only in the United States, but the world. That's why we have the world. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't want to brag. <laughs> so when I connected with Jill, I didn't know it's, I mean, it was really to be an advisor. I, and then she goes, you have no idea what you're getting yourself in. And I was like, you know, I think we're kind of pre-selling these franchises. And she goes, if you, you have no idea what you're doing. You need me to run this. And I was like, if that's an option, I'll take it. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were in Hawaii and uh, you're like, yeah, it's getting kind of stagnant. And I like the, uh, the high growth craziness. So that's true. I looked at it with my lack of experience and I thought, well, we can't really, we don't have revenues yet, but thinking maybe with the sales hack, people are going to buy franchises for Bennett, maybe from Jill because she has experience and I don't. So I told myself that I was going to go knock doors again to do solar if needed. Like it, the company's in better hands with me knocking doors to pay for Jill's to, to run the company than me trying to figure it out myself. Uh, but yeah, that was about two years ago. And I think, I think it was a great decision um, to kind of get somebody um, with way more experience and then try to stay out of your way. I don't do a great job of that, but I try to stay out of your way. Well, we're, we're an interesting combination because I'm conservative. He's not, we're yin and yang. And, but I will say one thing about Bennett is he's very good about, cause I remind him weekly, stay out of it, stay out of it. And he does for the most part until he forgets. And, but he's really good about trusting trusting me and um and then at the same time getting a bunch of advice from other people to validate what i've said i'll just appreciate like, i asked another advisor and then i said jill and so they said she goes like just told you that <laughs> so as an advisor jill calls me and is like hey bennett's gonna come and ask you this this is what you need to tell him and then um and, th and that's how this thing works no i'm i'm teasing on that and but good idea though eric <laughs> But I, Jill, you appreciate that he goes and gets that advice, knowing what you said, you know, it's to be true, but do you appreciate the fact that he goes and has other advisors where he kind of listens to them and comes back to you with a, with a yay or an A? Yeah, ab I, I actually do. I mean, Bennett is, he is really, really good at networking. And um, I do appreciate the the support team that we have behind us with the advisors and um, all the other people that he talks to on a regular basis. You know, a lot of times what I'm doing is head down, getting the job done, and and he's out there pushing dirty dough, making connections, bringing good opportunities to us. And so, in that way, it's very complimentary. I agree, Bennett. I think at least for me, I'm speaking for myself, it took me a while to be comfortable in the fact that some of my superpowers are networking, are, you know, are, are is vision, um, um, my reach, who I know, 
how and who knows me and that I'm a phone call away from different experts to be able to give advice on different things and you know that it's that true kind of visionary and that's my superpower it took me years to become comfortable with that thinking my superpower as a business owner should be operations and realizing it's really not do you go through any of that type of uh mindset as you uh, as you've grown in business yeah even before owning business just as a manager i realized i can recruit a lot of people i could teach them how to sell but i'm not good at managing because i go on to the next project before i finish the first so anyways year, years ago I, I went through that of um just knowing what i'm good at and what i'm not good at and managing people not not great at people where would you be today if you had been sitting in jill seat and there was no jill and there was bennett the visionary doing what she she had done so two years ago you didn't have her come in and it was you where would the company be today and where is it actually today i think we would have sold a decent amount of franchises not that many and we probably would have five stores open right now uh the, my, my goal actually before meeting jill because anyways this got brought up uh with some emails was as i was trying to get advisors i was emailing the owner of a pizza place and i said our goal is to have five or sorry, 30 stores open at five years. That was that was my goal. Right now we have 47, I think, open and another eight mobile. So we're at 55 franchises and it's been a one month under two years since, since filing the actual document. So, it, it, I mean, just a thousand percent different. I didn't know how to set up and I still don't know how to set up all the systems to actually open it. Last month we opened up 10 franchises Next week, I think we have six on the calendar for a week. There's just absolutely no way I could have done that. Jill, you've been like you've 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 seen different founders come and go. You've you've had your own brand that you started. You advised another one. Like, is that pretty typical? What you would see in a in a visionary trying to do the ops role in a brand and being happy with a lower franchisee open count? No, because I don't think they get that far. I think they realize really quickly, I don't like this. And um, I can, you know, I'm more valuable somewhere else. And um, so I haven't seen many. And that was why when my original plan was to help other people franchise their business, they were both, please just run our company for us. Because they knew. I mean, it's it's a very thankless job. and And franchising is difficult. And, you know, we have a contractual, it's, it's not, you know, it's not loosey goosey. We have a contractual obligation to fulfill, um, our, and, and so to do that, it's quite complicated on the back end, especially with the growth that we're having right now. Um, but it is a team we've got a, you know, we still have a skeleton crew. We still have probably half the team that we need, but this team has been in it for the long haul and they're very committed and it's been more of a collective effort to um, develop these systems. I like systems. I like strategy. And to me, it, you know, every day is a roller coaster, but you know, people pay big money to go on roller coasters. It's a, it's a rush. And then it's, you know, you hit the real scary parts. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just think it's two different personalities. Now, I was both, and um, I think you're too emotionally involved as a founder slash CEO, and um, you just need to be a little bit removed from it. That's just my opinion. Let's shift into mobile. Um, one of our brands at Front Street Equity, uh, they they go into salon suite, so they can go into a salon suite, set up a uh, set up. Um, their kind of satellite location there, provide services, and <clears throat> uh, it's short-term rent, not a lot of employees. There's a number of different reasons why we like that model. And I know other brands are doing a similar thing in salon suites and looking at mobile. So um, there's a lot of different reasons why this type of, uh, this type of model works, but I'd love to hear from you guys, um, just like your background's obviously mobile, uh, Jill. But when did that come into play at Dirty Dough and kind of give us the evolution of that and where you think it might be going? 
So that was really the hook for me. Um, on that conversation that Ben and I had prior to me coming on board, I asked to see the FDD, looked it over, started thinking about it, and thought, man, this is a perfect mobile um, transition. It really would work really well. It's unique um, for mobile. And we can streamline the operations to have it be super effective um, for s speed. Anyway, so from before I even came on board, I was thinking, oh, this needs to be mobile as well. Now, if you ask me what the perfect combination is, I will tell you one brick and mortar, one mobile. And here's why. The brick and mortar, obviously, you've got you know, three to six months to build out. You can get your mobile trailer, dirty dough mobile trailer, which is basically a kitchen on wheels. You can get that within 30 days. You can get out in your community and start marketing for your store, your brick and mortar that will be open, building your clientele, building the awareness in your area. It's also, uh, there's just so many benefits for that particular scenario. But as far as the mobile itself, what I do know that's critical is you need to stand out in a crowd. And that was, you know, if you see our trailers, you'll see there are Tiffany blue with big graphics of cookies on them. And, um, and the other way we stand out is we have a special fan on the top of our trailers it's, that pushes the smell out into the crowd. Smell sells. And... Uh, that's a, I mean, that is proven over and over, at least for me that, you know, you don't really need to do any marketing if you've got a good smell shooting out in the crowd. And what better smell is there than fresh baked cookies baked right there. Um, and so that, and then streamlining it so that we can really go through these large crowds very quickly. So the amount of revenue that you can do in a mobile trailer at one good event is significantly more than what you will do probably in you know multiple days at a brick and mortar so they complement each other you can also share your employees um, you use your brick and mortar as your commissary just endless benefits for doing both that way but just standing on its own it's a great business it's a great business we have enough room in those trailers to be able to do about 20000 in revenue per day. Um, two ovens. Well, that's so what you're saying there, there's enough what? Enough. Oh, dough. Sorry. Enough dough. It's not saying that's the revenue that, that franchisees would be doing. It's saying there's enough dough in there to be able to do that kind of revenue. Yes. This 8 by 18 foot trailer can hold enough dough, frozen dough, to do about $20,000. You know, you can have backup and do more than that. But, and then the, with the two ovens and the equipment in there, if you have a really good streamlined system, it's just quite impressive the kind of volume that you can do. Some of these men's size, size events, these arts festivals, these farmers markets, these community events, those are great too. Y you show up, you work for four hours and it's great money, a couple of people in there. So the advantage is I can go on and on and on, but you know, you don't have any long-term lease. You're, you're not locked into a fixed location. It's streamlined on the labor. You have, you know, we, we have a lot less labor required in our stores than most of our competitors, but cut that in half for the mobile operation. So it's labor is, you know, should be 10%, 10 to 12%. Um, you kind of create your own schedule. You have the captive audience. So you're not out there trying to get customers. They're coming to you, which is a totally different mentality, which is a dream really. Um, so it's just, it, you can charge more too. Um, and it's just a great way to build the brand overall for the entire company. Like it. I like it. Bennett, what would you add to that? Like, you know, obviously kind of some from some of your first conversations with Jill and you knowing her background with mobile, that was probably always in the back of your mind. And that's what you used to sell her to believe in you. Uh, like give us give us your your um, perspective on mobile and, and how it's going. 
Yeah, so again, two, two years ago, I went to a football game uh, in California. USC was playing, and they had a cookie trader. They are selling these little mini kind of overcooked chocolate chip cookies, and the line door just so long. I could never even try them. Then I went tracked him down later, got in touch with the manager, and he kind of told me, you know, some of the, the numbers. And they brought two trailers that did $23,000 worth of sales in under four hours, and then went home. And I'm like, that's a great business. Uh, cause it's just, you know, lines as, as long as you can see, but yeah, you're going to them. The other thing is just like right now with people not spending as much as they did last year with the economy, um, you're a lot more resistant to those changes because people are still going out. And when you go out, we're still spending money. So you're, and then it, Jill mentioned the lease, you're not citing this long lease if that event doesn't work out, you just go to the next one. Um, especially in our model, like what we sell the cookie pucks, these pre portioned cookie pucks, they're a dollar delivery right now. Maybe in the store they're selling for four bucks, but at these events, maybe they're selling for six dollars. So your cost of goods is the same, but now you're charging so much more. And that's also, you know, and your labor's lower. So it's just such an easy, and then the cost to open one up, you can do an SBA loan there because it's asset asset based it's a lot quicker you typically get better terms 30-day approvals so you can get into a business like the trailer's 85k um and you can get that through an sda loan and then be operating in just a few months so that's that's another big thing rather than paying you know 100 grand or whatever for the build out it's just 85k you're in um we take care of all the product you show up to the events. so i think franchisors out there um, you should probably be thinking about what in your brand can you take outside of the four walls, whatever that is. doesn't have to be a trailer. So we're talking about trailers and mobile. But w when we look at brands to invest in and to bring to market at Front Street, we're always thinking, what can we do to generate revenue outside of the four walls? And if you get smart people, innovative people with their heads around that, there's a lot of things that you could do. Maybe it's e-commerce, maybe it's events, going to events and, and selling your product. So I think um, as a franchisor, put on that hat of how can I generate revenue outside of these four walls? And then as a prospective franchisee looking at buying into brands, I see this more and more. I see mobile stuff coming up. I see the franchising industry as a whole, especially the broker community, getting behind some of these brands that are doing mobile and in food or or you know, in, in service or products like Dirty Dough. And so this is definitely becoming more and more popular, more mainstream, like in that broker consultant community, they are uh, pushing brands that have this mobile component to it. Um, and I know some of the early franchisees with Maui Wowie are in the consulting world and, um, and they're believers in that as well. So, um, so I really like that. Any, um, where do you see... Uh, what are franchisees saying about it? Like, what are the franchisees loving about it? And maybe there might be some lessons learned, things that you're tweaking or moving forward based on some of the things you're finding out. You know, it's not for everybody, but it's perfect for some personalities. I, I'm thinking of a, a franchise group that we had that came into training two months ago. They already had 22 events booked. And they'd just been rocking and rolling and keeping their, you know, equipment busy and doing all sizes of events, big ones, little ones. Their very first event, um, we had kind of told them, you know, the average capture rate uh, at an event for our customer is maybe five, ten percent. And they said, we got eighty percent. It was just a little small event. And so, you know, there's a lot of power in these small events where there's just, you know, people are going there to buy. Um, so that type of personality that is out there hustling, obviously you're not going to make any money if you're not, you know, trying to get into events and then being professional at these events so that you get invited back. But um, I, I just kind of think that, yes, it isn't for everybody, but if you think it is for you, you really need to have an open mind about it because of the potential for promoting your brick and mortar. Um, we're evolving. So 
these trailers right now are designed to go out to Burning Man in the Nevada desert. You don't need any electricity or Coachella or some of these, you know, remote places. You can go all over the country with it. So you're not limited to and restricted by power. We're looking at um, evolving with what we're doing and improving it. We know we had the first rendition. We've moved to the second rendition now. We're working on the third rendition, which is just continually tweaking of what we know works from the feedback that we get from people out in the field. Uh, we're meeting on a monthly basis with our mobile operators and they're telling us the good and bad. And they're really the ones that are giving us the information that we need to improve our systems. Which, by the way, I think uh, brick and mortar, mobile, you want to hear a franchise or that says, yes, we are learning from our franchisees. This was version one. This is version two. This is version three. And you want to, uh, your, the brand that you get into, you want them to always be improving, whether it's on mobile or brick and mortar or whatever it is, you want to hear how they're improving. So um, I didn't know how you're going to answer that. And I know that you guys are always learning and improving based on the feedback that you hear. But I think it's really important for people out there, for franchisors to listen to franchisees. You just said you're learning for franchisees out there, boots on the ground, doing it. It's important for franchisees to have a franchise, a relationship with your franchisor where you can communicate that stuff up the chain to the corporate office and they actually do listen. So I love that. Bennett, anything to add? Well, oh, Jill. I just want to say the other uh, important piece is that they're coaching each other. So they're... De- they're realizing what best practices work. So on that regular webinar that we had, they're sharing what works, what to avoid, how to, you know, when you run up against this problem, what do you do? How do you prepare in advance? You know, what are, most of uh, the conversations are about, you know, how do we, how do we maximize this potential of this event and set our, our, um, mobile kitchen up so that we can really capture everybody and generate a lot of revenue. I'm expecting something really good from Bennett here, like earth shattering. So let's let it rip, Bennett. There is a group with all the franchisees that are always asking each other. Wait, seeing franchisees help each other um, without court reps to jump in, definitely super beneficial. Uh, I think on the... But hold on, right there, that is something super simple But franchisors out there, that's critical to get franchisees together, talking, facilitate that so they can learn from each other. And then you can bring in experts and and whatnot. But I hear too many franchisors out there that are not are that are not building that type of community with their with their franchisees. And so it may sound simple, but franchisors ask yourself and franchisees, if you're not getting it, push your franchisors for it. But if you're not getting that peer level learning from uh, your fellow franchisees, you're definitely missing out. That's one of the most valuable things about being in a f- really good franchise system. Well, to to the franchisors, I would say you need to be able to moderate it because the risk is that it becomes a runaway train where they're not sharing best practices, but they're sharing inaccurate things and then therefore giving implied permission to everybody in the system to set their own hours or, you know, the different things that they do. Oh, I, I, I do this and, and it's totally off brand and they're not allowed to do it. So to be able to um, have an interactive um, communication is really critical. 100%. And right now, and this doesn't just go apply to the mobile, but to the brick and mortar, um, our operations people are going to all of their franchisees, including the dozen stores and asking everybody, what are your top three practices? And then we're ranking up from zero to 20 to be able to roll out. So that, that is something that we'll work out literally this week is just collecting what everybody thinks their best practices are, organizing that. And then again, we want it to rank it one through 20, create SOPs around it, and then give it back to the franchisees. But it's really coming from the franchises. We're just organizing the information. Well, this is great, but you guys are missing one big thing. Um, And I don't think you know this. I don't think you understand what's actually happening here, but uh, cookies are a fad. Like that's a fad. 
and they will not be around next year. <laughs> I said that about smoothies in 1983. So, you know, and, and how long have you been eating cookies, Eric? A long time. And Tropical Smoothie did not get that memo. They didn't, they didn't get that memo. And I know how well their franchisees are doing. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. It's sort of like pizza. I think, you know, pizza delivery started in the 1800s. I think, I mean, don't quote me on that. It's a fact. You said it here. It's a fact. <laughs> Along with all the other facts. Yeah. I think it's here to stay. I think that the, um, you know, it'll be bumpy in the future. And again, that's where I think that our um, safety is in the ongoing brand awareness created through the mobile operators out there hitting the masses with the smell. Bennett, what, what say you on, um, on, uh, on this thing that you had never heard before until I brought it up just now? Uh, the Great American Cookie Company and Mrs. Fields both started in 1977. So. And that's a fact, too. That's a fact. Both of them have multiple hundred locations open after 46 years and so many cookies, two decades, multiple hundred, uh, locations open. So, uh, you know, there's cookies. We have been around forever. It's not like cupcakes or frozen yogurt. We were just eating it because there's a new shop. Most Americans eat cookies on a monthly basis. It's, but, but all food and all franchising probably for that matter, is, is cyclical, right? It goes up, it goes down. Uh, so we've been in a really high cookie market and, I think as the market tightens, you know, everybody's or, or becomes more saturated. Uh, everybody's top line sales will suffer from that. So at that point, who's got the lowest break even? And because we centralize our production, talking brick and mortars, you know, we can operate out 700 square feet, one employee, little to no waste, uh, fixed, you know, cost of goods because we get the uh, basically fixed because we get both purchasing and we mass produce everything. And then on the mobile side, again, you're not even stuck to even a 700 square foot. You're stuck to, to no lease. You get to go to where people are, you know, whatever happens at, in a town or community, you go over to the next one. So I think it's, we, we've done this and we plan for the cookie market to, to be cyclical and to come down and to be best positioned with the lowest um, break even for any of our competitors. So let's look at this from a, a, just a, a little bit different angle. Thanks for that, by the way, because I think that's a question that most people have when they're thinking about buying a, a cookie franchise um, right now. And appreciate I appreciate the directness in that. What would you say you are who your competitors are? You know, some people could say the direct competitors that are selling cookies, or it might be the dessert or donuts or impulse buys or catering or whatever it is. So like what, what, who are your competitors? I would say the dessert category is our competitors. There's a lot of options these days, you know, um, just when I went to dirty dough last night, there were about, um, in that big complex, there were about five dessert options to choose from. I mean, that's just kind of how it is now, um, wherever you go. So I would, I would say desserts in general. What do you think, Bennett? Yeah. I mean, the, the, yeah, more specifically, obviously the gourmet cookie space, but yeah, even if there's a cinnamon roll place or even a smoothie place, um, you know, across the street, we're, we're competing for that dessert business. So we, we kind of, the two spikes, one after lunch, one slightly larger after dinner. And that's where we're anyway. I think it's important for franchise everybody, buyers, Zors, and Zs to be looking at the threats in your that that are threatening your brand or your location. And it takes me back to the tax business. The tax business today is very different. It's a very different landscape than it was 20 years ago when I was in it. And the threat there, everybody thought it was going to be the flat tax every year. People would not buy a tax franchise because they're like, it's election time and they're talking about a flat tax and that will probably happen. And that was always the threat. And, you know, and we knew being in the business, that's not probably going to happen for a bunch of different reasons. 
Um, and it still hasn't happened. And I'm sure people are still not getting into the tax business because of that. What has changed in the tax business is is legislation around the loaning uh, loaning tax customers money before their tax income return come or their 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 refund comes back. That's changed. Interest rates, the way that it's done, the way that banks do things, that is what is massively changed in the tax business. So it a lot of these, the customer base has changed, who they serve, how they serve it. A lot of that has changed drastically in the past 20 years in the tax business. I think at least with this, you kind of know what's happening and you know who, what your threats are. You know the category that you play in and you become innovative and are doing things like mobile in in this type of, of business. So I think anybody that's thinking about buying a franchise, you need to have these honest conversations with yourself and ask, you know, the they're not even hard questions. They're just questions to the franchise or like this. But I think it's followed up with what are you doing to compete in that space? What are you doing that your competition might not be doing? And how do you see this this uh, this whole space unfolding over the next five and 10, 15 and 20 years? I think if you have a franchise or that's innovative and isn't saying, hey, just go into it blindly, cover your eyes, we're fine. Um, you might not, that might be a brand that you may not want to have that long-term relationship with. But if they're looking at things like artificial intelligence and how to reduce labor costs and other revenue streams outside of the four walls, that's interesting as somebody that is a buyer of, of, of any brand, really. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. That's a good point, Eric. Um, so in 40 years of mobile, think of all the things that have gone on in the world. We had 18% interest rate. We had the gas embargo or gas was so outrageous. We had 9-11. Um, you name it, all the things that have happened that you would think would kill the mobile side of the business. The opposite actually happened. People couldn't make some of the major investments that they maybe were planning on or go on a trip, but they they did staycations. They went to events. They treated themselves, and um, and I and so it has been interesting for that length of time to see the ups and downs of all the scary things that happen in the world, and how it didn't have an effect on our business until COVID. Now, who could have ever anticipated COVID, which, you know, shut the world down, basically. So I think the moral of the story here is it, people are always going to treat themselves, no matter what, to, to something small. Um, and, and we don't know what's going to happen. Who could have ever anticipated what COVID would do to us? But um you know, I just think you just have to kind of move forward with courage and a lot of these things, if it makes sense for you. All right. We are winding down our time here. Any last bits of wisdom, thoughts, either of you two or both of you? Well, I think, you know, as far as franchising itself, and I think it's really, really important to look at what's your support like. Do I like the product? Does it resonate with me? Do I like the, the culture of that company? And am I going to get what I need when I need it? And those are the things that I would look for if I were buying a franchise. But primarily it would be, am I going to get the support that I need? Because that's really why you're buying a franchise. But then to be able to have, like you said, these other options that you know brick and mortar doesn't work for me right now. I'm going to start with a mobile and see how I like it and then add on to it, maybe with a brick and mortar when a space opens up or when it's right for my life. Um, so the flexibility I think is also something which you've already hit on. So I won't, you know, regurgitate that, but I think that's important as well. But the, you know, I just, I just really think for everybody, it's a very personal decision of culture and and fit and does this vibe it's a vibe i go by vibes a lot Ben, it doesn't but i go by vibes <laughs> bennett what about you yeah i don't i don't know how to define the vibe um i i guess speaking in the last question on um i guess innovation like how, how do you innovate cookies that are out of program right and 
but but we have done the processes to innovate to have the three layer cookies to have to be able to do catering at a much higher margin because we machine portion everything with hand portion that we could do same day catering where any other companies of the catering you know cookie gourmet cook, cookie catering space are typically three day turnaround um introducing types of you know kind of other products so when we looked at it when we started franchising it was you know there's nothing proprietary per se about cookies so how are you going to get that? And it was really what separated us is we were willing to make the upfront investment into the team, the warehouse, the machines, the trucks, all of that, where everybody else is kind of like, here's, you know, my grandma's recipe, whether it's cookies or subways, or whatever, here's the recipe, go do everything yourself, where we invest in that infrastructure. So now we can benefit from gluten-friendly products and same-day catering and three-layer cookies and protein cookies. And we've experimented with other different products. So anyways, kind of really investing into we're going to be different and all of our franchisees are always going to ha have a competitive advantage because corporate invested up front into a system and a model to allow us to, to rapidly expand and benefit from, you know, economies of scale. Hey, Eric, would you like a caffeine cookie? Yes. That's coming. A caffeine cookie, January. I'm ready. I'm re My wife may not want me to have it. She thinks I have too much caffeine as it is. So we'll just let her know. Just it's just a cookie. Hey Bennett, um, you have a podcast that um, I haven't been on. Haven't really been been invited on. Like I, I haven't been pursued. So, but why don't you tell the audience? Nor have I, Eric. They can listen to your pod. Where did, what's your podcast name? How can they listen to your podcast? Deeper than dough. So it's, we're focused on dough as in money. You know, finding joy fulfillment despite life's journey. That's not what you like. But anyways. Apple, Spotify, YouTube, wherever. Yeah. You just don't Google my name with that dirt uh, deeper than dough because you won't find our episode, everyone. I just want to make that known. But guys, thank you so much for coming on. It's very selective. <laughs> I'll get on it someday. Someday when I make the final cut after he stops having all his famous friends on there. Someday when re you reply to the text messages. Ah, ah. Thanks for listening to the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Links to everything can be found over at FranchiseSecrets.com. And if you want my help with anything from starting your own franchise to growing your current franchise business, please visit scalablefranchise.com.